lot of opportunity to um, move to Japan when I was 16 years old. And uh, since then, I've been living there for five years, and the latest two years between uh, 2006 and 2008. And I got the opportunity to um, be inside the first research team who got inside uh, Toyota's uh, car dealer shops. And um, there are 500 car dealer shops in Japan selling car dealer, I mean Toyota cars. And Toyota, they have developed one role model shop, which is the number one shop in Japan. Toyota says that they have adopted Toyota production systems. So I stood in a corner um, of that particular shop for 2,000 hours trying to register what kind of tools are they using, what kind of routines do they have, and extract what is this really about when applying TPS in a new setting, meaning non-manufacturing setting. And I'm going to show you a video from um, this role model shop, and what I want you to look at is how they use information. So please, play the video.
So usually when I show this video, many people say, how old is it? Is it like 30 years old? Or like, well, they don't even use computers. I mean, where are all the information technology? Or there's so much details. How can they even work there? Still, it might be the most profitable car dealer shop in the world. And I think their way of using information is extremely interesting. When we look at it, when we see all the different visualization boards, we can feel, well, there's a lot of information. But think about if you were to go into your intranet and extract all the information you have and put up on your walls, how many walls would you need? Because they talk about active information and passive information. They say as soon as we put in information in our digital information system, the data will become very easily passive, meaning we have to invest effort in order to access the information. And usually when we make incorrect decisions, it's not because we are stupid, it's almost all the time because we lack information. So Toyota, they say, we have to develop an operation system, an operating system where we don't have to invest any effort in order to access the information. One click away is yesterday's news. They say one look away, just one glance away. That's when we can make effective decisions, meaning the right thing, and we can be efficient, meaning we can fulfill the customer need in, 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 an, in a good way. So, many times in Sweden, when we talk about visualization, we develop visualization boards, and people said, well, who's going to update this? But that's under the prerequisite that we have the active information in our, in our computers and the passive information on our wall. But at Yota, it's the opposite. They have the active information on the walls. They work on the walls, but when they go home, they may make a backup in the information system. And they say, well, what information do we really need in order to understand exactly how we are doing? Are we normal level, above normal level, below normal level? Just one look away. Still, I mean, we've been working with Lean for 25 years, even more, to extract what they actually are doing. We um, asked the leading Lean authorities in Sweden, what is Lean? And they told us these different answers. It's a way of working, it's a philosophy, it's methods, and some people even talk about it's tools. I mean, it's a whiteboard, that's when, when we are Lean. But when extracting information, I think it's important not only to look at what people do, the methods, or what they have. The interesting thing is to ask why are they doing things, or why are they having things? Because, I mean, Toyota, they have whiteboards everywhere. You saw it, on every single wall they have whiteboards with information. But why do they have a whiteboard? Well, I usually use this metaphor in order to describe what has happened with Lean. And that is, if I were to ask you if you want a fruit, a pear, or a green apple, that's a stupid question, because a fruit, that's a general definition. While a pear and an apple, that's a little bit more specific, and a green apple is even more specific. So, I could talk about the green apple that I got in the hotel lobby, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I could get really specific. So, when it comes to knowledge, sometimes we define knowledge on a fruit level, and sometimes we develop it on a green apple level. And what has happened with Lean is that we have been quite a lot of stuck here on a green apple level, meaning we have, it's specified to car manufacturing, it's Japanese operations, and it's within manufacturing. So, we have been trying to spread knowledge about green apples and apply it to peers, and that's the incorrect. But by asking why, we can extract the interesting knowledge that is really applicable for any company or for any manager. So, for instance, if we have a whiteboard, well, that's exactly on this level. A green apple level, very specific tools. But if we start to say, well, why do we use a whiteboard? Well, we want to visualize the schedule of the people working in the car dealer shop. Well, why do we want to do that? Well, sometimes there are customers coming in that we didn't expect, so we want to have flexible capacity, so they can easily help the customer. So it's about flexible workforce. Why do, we, why do we want to have that? Well, we don't want the customer to wait. Why is that? Well, our core priority is to focus on the customer and not capacity utilization. So by asking why, 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 we can extract some really interesting things here on the top. 
And what I did in my research was that I codified all the tools and all the methods and asked these why questions and see what did we end up with. And I found three interesting decisions which I think Toyota is making a little bit different than many other co companies. The three different decisions, and that's what I'm going to talk about here today. So the first decision is how we view efficiency. And here's an example. I've taken this example from healthcare, and um, this is a story about Alison. One morning, she feels a lump in her breast, and she gets, of course, worried. And in Sweden, the um, diagnose process looks like this. She gets in contact with the local doctor's surgery, she gets an appointment after a while, then she meets the doctor, investigates the breast, if they cannot rule out breast cancer, they will write a referral to the mammography. Unfortunately, she has to go home for a while and wait. Then she goes there, she makes the mammography, she goes home again, then after a while, she will meet the breast surgeon who got the result from the x-ray. Once she have met the breast surgeon, if they still cannot rule out breast cancer, they will write the referral to the cytologist. And the cytologist makes this puncture, a biopsy of this potential tumor. Again, she gets the appointment there, she goes there, she goes home, and then the last step in this process is to meet the breast surgeon again, where they can say, you have breast cancer or not. So we have a fairly long process here. How long do you think it takes? Two months? It's a fairly good um, answer. 42 days. So that means if we were to put up the film camera, I mean metaphorically speaking, if we were to put up a film camera on her shoulder and film this process, we would have a fairly long movie, meaning 42 day long movie. But if I were to give this to someone and say, well, here I have a raw material, it's a 42 day, two day long movie, it's not really an action movie. If we were to cut that down into an action movie, how long would the action movie be? Very short, because we know this is an uh, example from other part of Sweden, and um, they developed something called a one-stop breast clinic, where all the doctors work together. There were several people, seven people: the radiologist, the cytologist, and the breast surgeon, working together with different nurses. And you could go there as a woman, and you could get very fast treatment. So they were actually able to do it in two hours instead of 42 days. This means that. Um, the difference is quite big, 500 times faster. And the question here is, how is this possible? This was just some years ago in Sweden when they made this improvement of 500 times. Well, I think this is the first choice. How do we define efficiency? And we have two forms of efficiencies. The first way to define efficiency is to take the perspective from a resource. That's would be to put up a film camera on the doctor. And when the doctor comes to work, he or she wants to have action on his or her camera during the whole day. So we want to utilize the competence of a doctor or a nurse or x-ray machine or the equipment. So we put up the film camera on the actual resource. So theoretically speaking, we can say, well, here we have a resource. We want to utilize that resource, so we have to secure that we have different flow units. So we have the doctor here, we film her every day and secure that she always has something to process. So we maximize value adding time. But in the other type of efficiency, we put up the film camera on Alison. And that means on the patient or what is being processed, the code or the house that is being renovated. We put up the film camera on the flow unit instead. That means that we take a different perspective of, on efficiency. Instead of putting up the film camera on the resource, we put up the film camera on the flow unit. That means that we are not maximizing value adding time, we're maximizing value receiving time. So this is the very core of our operation strategy. Are we maximizing value adding time or value receiving time? Shall the patient adopt to the doctors or shall the doctor adopt to the patient? In the internal document at Toyota, they said, learn TPS in one sentence. And they said, it's better to attach people to work than work to people. So secure that there are always people to process what is being, what should be processed, instead of securing that keep everyone busy.
So we have two forms of efficiencies. The first form, resource efficiency, and then the next form, flow efficiency. Here we put focus on the resources, while in the other we put focus on what is being processed. We organize it in different ways. But in the first case, we want to maximize capacity utilization, while in the other case, we want to maximize the way we fulfill the needs. The organization is done in terms of islands. We have different islands that is running around, doing different things, different functions, different clinics within hospitals, while when it comes to flow efficiency, we are working more as one system, multi-competent people. When working on, uh, as different islands, we will develop different specialists. There will be different kings and queens on each island, while when it comes to flow efficiency, we have to work in a multi-competent team. And my first question to you is, if you look it into your everyday work, which one of these forms of efficiency do you focus on most? Resource efficiency or flow efficiency? Take one minute. Talk with the person sitting next to you. What, where is your focus on flow efficiency or resource efficiency? If you have to generalize a little bit. Please go ahead. So, how many would say that you are focusing more on resource efficiency? Please raise your hand. And how many would say that if you look into your whole company, you focus more on flow efficiency? Please raise your hand. It's a little bit less on, on flow efficiency. And I think it's a fairly stupid question because it's not either or. It's about how to combine these two forms of efficiencies. So, how can we create an operating system where we are both flow efficient and resource efficient? And then to my next question, which one shall we prioritize first out of these two? Shall we prioritize resource efficiency first, develop different islands, we know exactly what each island are doing, or are we going to develop a flow, of, flow efficient organization first, secure that we can handle this process and then we maximize the uh, resource efficiency? What would you, how many say, would say that we should focus on resource efficiency first? Raise your hand. No one. That's actually right. What? we in research can see, uh, can see is that we should always, always focus on flow efficiency. And then the question is, why? Why do you think we should focus on flow efficiency? What is the main objective by focusing on flow efficiency? Well, the main answer is, of course, well, it's the customer who pays for our products and services. Well, I would say that that's one of the main or the most logical answer to that question. What I would rather say is that the interesting answer motivating why we should focus on flow efficiency is because what kind of organization will be developed long term if we focus on resource efficiency in contrast to flow efficiency. What we in research can see is when we focus on resource efficiency, this island type of organization will be developed. And if we have an island type of organization, we will develop different kings and queens on each island, meaning that there will be a subculture developed where we feel a little bit better than the other island because there we have a queen and here we have have a king, and the longer we work in that way, the more focused we will be, t tend to focus on our things. And what we can see in research is that these organizations, they are really, really busy. And the problem is, they are not busy with developing customer value. They are busy with taking care of all the problems happening in between the different islands. And this is what we called failure demand or superfluous work. So, the more we focus on an island, the more busy we will be. So, we have here, we have both pros and cons. As I said, here we have high capacity utilization when it comes to resource efficiency. However, the throughput time will take long time. If everyone is busy, there will be waiting time in front of each island. Compared to um, flow efficiency, here we have short throughput time. The capacity utilization, 
will be a little bit less we have to secure to have free capacity all the time. So the good thing here is the short throughput time. The good thing here is the high capacity utilization. While the bad thing is low capacity utilization and the bad thing here is the long throughput time. And what we are saying here is that we should always prioritize throughput time first or flow efficiency because what we can see in these organizations is that there will be a lot of waste and it's not waste on the different islands, it is waste between the different islands. And that is, we think we are busy or being efficient when we work all the time, but in fact the more we work, the more inefficient we will be. And we call that the efficiency paradox, meaning we, if we define efficiency as being busy, that's the worst kind of scenario that can happen in an organization because as soon as we are busy, things will start to take long time. If things take long time, then we have to handle many things at the same time. If we have to handle many things at the same time, that will generate problem because the brain cannot handle more than seven things approximately at the same time. And then there will be restarts and handovers. And we, when we have handovers, there will be like a whispering game within our organization. You know, when we played as uh, kids, we were sitting in a circle and we, we were whispering around. So, it takes the longer time it takes, the more things we have to handle, and the more handovers we have, the more problem we will have to handle, handle by our, ourselves. So, we should always focus on flow efficiency, irrespective of, of industry or ir irrespective of, of, of context. So, what I think is interesting, and what I think has been lacking a little bit within the lean texture is that why are we actually doing it? If we were to bring out one thing that the man a manager should focus on, if we get inspired by Toyota, that is the flow efficiency. How can we develop a flow efficient organization? So we have two forms of efficiency. Resource efficiency, we um, increase the capacity utilization and we have flow efficiency, meaning we increase throughput time, or we increase flow efficiency and we decrease the throughput time. So, in what, which way shall we improve? I mean, this way we improve the efficiency of the islands, this way we improve system efficiency. The problem is that this is so much easier. It's, it's so much easier to improve resource efficiency compared with flow efficiency. Because this will drive independency. If we develop island organization, that will d d develop an independent organization with different islands. While if we develop a flow efficient organization, that will die de dependability. And we know that it's difficult to cooperate. If we, I mean, the first time we move in with a partner, we know it's like landing a spaceship. It takes time because we have to adapt to the other values of the other, other person. And that is exactly what is happening when we drive flow efficiency. Still, we can see that the productivity of organization focusing on flow efficiency is so much higher than resource efficient organization because they are only focusing or more focusing on true customer value. Still, it's a challenge. I mean, I always use this metaphor. I mean, if I were to um, live, um, I live in a, in a house in Sweden where we have 10 different apartments. There are 10 different families. I've been living there for six years and we had uh, uh, an old lady, her name was Gun. She um, passed away a month ago. She had been living there for 50 years and we have Stefan and Holger. I mean, we have many different people there. If I were to bring out everyone on the street and say, well, I'm Niklas, I'm the lean guy, and now we're going to think a little bit different. From now on, everyone is going to sleep in apartment one, and we're going to have breakfast in apartment two, and we're going to have bathroom in apartment three, and we're going to have showers in apartment four, and we're going to have the tea room where we check out the World Cup in apartment five, and so on. We base the different apartments on 10 different needs. How long time? would it take to make that house work again? I mean, you, the most straightforward answer is it will never work. Well, think about it. Well, how long time would it take to make the kitchen work? In one sense, it would be impossible. Who would like to have breakfast together with Holger or Gunn? 
But in one sense, we could make it work instantly, but it requires quite nice leadership to make that happen. To have a positive attitude, to adapt to everyone, to have teamwork, to respect each other, to have discipline and work together. I mean, we could m make it work like that, but then we really need some true management capabilities. It's very easy to say it will never work because we've been working like this in, in our island and we don't feel like it. So, going from resource efficient organization to flow efficient organization requires a total different set of cap capabilities. So, what we in research can see is that we should always prioritize flow efficiency first and then resource efficiency. And that's the first choice that I think Lean defined on fruit level, and it's the fruit level that is important for managers, that's the important thing to remember. Flow efficiency in front of resource efficiency. The next one is, well, how do they do this? Toyota, they have two principles. That is the central part of the Toyota production system. The first principle is just in time. We know about just in time, and that is flow efficiency. But they have one equally important principle, and that is Jidoka principle. Very, very research is done by, uh, re regarding the Jidoka principle. That means that I can easily describe what it is by using soccer or football. I mean, in football, uh, if we were to develop a flow-efficient organization in football, we can say that the ball would be moving all the time. So a flow-efficient soccer game, then the ball would be moving all the time towards uh, the goal. That would be flow efficiency. But in order to be able to do that, we need to access the right information. What, and what I mean here, irrespective of who you are on this football pitch, if you're this person here, or this person here, or this person there, everyone can see the football pitch. And everyone can see the players, everyone can see the goals, and everyone can see the actual football. So that means everyone has a perfect understanding of the process of the game. One look away, without any effort, you have a perfect understanding of all the information. Furthermore, if something good happens or something bad happens, then we have a referee blowing the whistle and say, well, here we have a goal, or here we have a red card, or yellow card, or whatever it is. Everyone gets instantly access to the information about when something good or something bad happens. Then, the last thing is that everyone has a perfect understanding about the progress. I mean, here we have 89 minutes and 30 seconds, and it's 5-1. Everyone has a perfect understanding about the progress of the game. It's not like after the game, we ask each other, who won the game? I mean, we know exactly who won the game, instantly, because we have perfect progress control. And I would say that's the last thing that they work with at Toyota. So everyone sees the system, everyone knows the goods and bads, and everyone has a perfect understanding about the progress. The problem with organization is that we don't have this perfect understanding. Rather, our organization looks like this. And, I mean, welcome to Sweden. This is how we do it in Sweden. We don't play soccer. We put up tents on the soccer and we have incentives. If a football comes in our tent, we kick it out as fast as possible. And the faster we kick it out and the more balls we kick out from our tents, the more value we create. And this is, in fact, exactly how organizations work today. And what is happening? what is happening. I mean, we have no control of the system, we have no control about the goods and the bads because we're stuck in our tents, and we have no control about the progress. I mean, it's only one player here. The rest are stuck in, in, in their tents. And this is, going back to the video, this is the Jidoka principle. How can we create an organization where we know exactly what is happening just one look away, one glance away? That's the conscious organization. We know exactly what is happening. I mean, the first time when I visited the, um, um, the role model shop, the manager took me and said, Niklas, I'm going to explain for you what Judoka is. And he put me in the middle of the room. He said, well, look in this direction. You know exactly how many cars we have sold today. You see that we're a little bit higher than yesterday, but it's still not that good. And here you see the de development process of attracting new customers, and here we have the distribution process, here we have the sales process, here we have the service process, and here we have the capacity utilization. He said, in 90 seconds, you know exactly how we're doing today compared to normality, how we're doing this week compared to normality, and how we're doing this month. Just one look away. 
And that's the Jidoka principle. So that's the second thing that I think they're always, always trying to improve. Instead of trying to monitor the outcome from an island, they try to monitor the progress from the whole system so we can see it just one look away. So flow efficiency. How can we as managers develop a flow efficient organization? And how can we as managers develop a transparent organization where everyone sees the system, not only in stuck in, inside their tent or stuck on their island? How can we develop an organization where we see the true progress of our company or our project? The last thing is, well, when are we lean then? I think this is the most interesting part of what, what they do at Toyota. I mean, uh, when can we say that we are lean? I mean, in Sweden, lean is used as a verb. We are going to leanify things, and it's used as an adjective. We are lean, but you are not lean. And then one can question, well, what do you, re what do you really mean when using lean as an adjective? I um, heard this story about a company. I actually met uh, Professor Leiker, who's the author of the Toyota Way, at the conference four and a half years ago. And I thought it was interesting to talk with him. And I said, well, because I've been always interested in what is lean. So I asked him at this conference, Professor Leiker, if you have been researching about Toyota for many, many years, if you were to extract what lean is, what would you say? I mean, if you could go inside a company, you could talk with anyone, talk to the customers, talk, to, talk with the suppliers, and you could go back and say, well, this was a really lean company. What would you look for? What indicators would be most important for you? And he said, Niklas, I don't know if you heard this story, but I will tell you a story that delivers my view. And he told me a story about the company that had been working with Lean for many years. And they were considered to be Lean. And um, they've been working with implementing all the tools, implementing all the methods, but they felt there must be something more. So they got in contact with Toyota Japan, and they got in contact with a man called Obasan. And Obasan, he had been the right hand of Ono-san, who invented the Toyota production systems. So they brought him there, and they wanted him to make a valid evaluation of their operations. And the first thing he said was, show me your factory. And if you have been to Japan, you know that they are not like uh, always the happy, charmy <laughs> people, especially not the Toyota people. They are really, really looking like samurai. So he, he said, show me the factory. So they brought him in, and he started to ask a lot of questions, really, really seriously. How do you do this? And how have you implemented this? And how do you work with this med? And blah, 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 blah. And they tried to, to, to answer. And um, after a while, they were really eager to get his support. And I said, well, what do you think? Are we lean? And the only thing he said, Hmm, impossible to say. And then they say, okay, funny Japanese. And then he continued with his, uh, with his questions, and after lunch again, they said, well, Obasan, what do you think? Are we lean? And again, they say, he said, hmm, impossible to say. Okay, so he continued with his questions, and by the end of the day, the president comes up to him, and the president said, well, Obasan, we brought you here because we wanted a valid evaluation of our operations. So please, can you tell us, are we lean or not? And then he just looked at him and he said, it's impossible to say because I wasn't here yesterday. And I think that really pinpoints what it's all about. I mean, this company, they thought that performance, it's about an absolute level. Now our KPIs are fulfilled. But he said, it's not about finding the big fish. It's, a, it's about developing a fishing organization where everyone fish all the time. So if I can come here at day one and see that you are delivering performance on this level, and then I can come here at day two and see that you're performing on this level, that's what I, will, what I would be looking for, to see a change from tomorrow till today and from today until the next day, and so on. So it's about developing a learning organization.
And I think that's very easy to talk about, of course. I mean, learning organization, how hard can it be? But do we really develop organizations that is optimized for execution, do what we always do, or do we develop organizations that is optimized for learning? When we make pancakes, do we just make the pancakes? Or when we make pancakes, do we make the pancakes so the next time we make the pancakes, we will be able to do it a little bit better? And I think that mindset is extremely interesting from a management perspective. How can we optimize learning within our organization? So there are three things that I think I would say uh, lean on a fruit level. It's about flow efficiency instead on resource efficiency. It's about monitoring the progress of the system instead of monitoring the outcome from a particular island. And it's about optimizing proactive learning. How would we do this if we were to learn instead of just reactive learning? We learn when something good or something bad happens. I hope that you got anything out from this. Thanks very much. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Now, the following session is going to be here, the plenary. So we have a bit of time for questions. Uh, I think that the, the, one of the challenges uh, about learning is uh, uh, you, uh, you, you don't know ev everything, you know. Sometimes there are experimentation and, and you fail. And if you're on a traditional uh, organization, this is not going to be well seen by, by senior management. Uh, what are your suggestions and recommendations you know, for those uh, organizations that are doing a transition? How to deal with learning and failure? I mean, I think that most organizations that are really implementing operational excellence or lean in a good way has been working a lot with the top management. If they are seeing problems as a negative thing, then they haven't really understood. I mean, the best leading companies in Scandinavia, they have educated all the people so they get the same glasses throughout the whole organization. And it should be the managers who, who, um, who, who teach the people about this. I mean, if we talk about learning organization and we give them example, I think everyone can adopt into that. I think it's just lack of education and lack of involvement. So if the top management is not involved, involved and have really deep understanding, it will never ever work. Um, I think that's uh, the most important part. Thank you. Uh, the remark, are you still working into uh, let's say lean within organization or you're now more focused as I uh, suggested in my uh, introduction on uh, personal development is there a difference between lean within organization and lean with personal development oh, I think the general principles is the same um, but it's just a different unit of analysis I mean we can work with systems and organizations and we can work with um, uh, with the individuals but I think if we don't have motivated individuals nothing will ever happen and we have a lot of stressed organizations that I think to, de to de develop work with individuals is a prerequisite for good, developing good teamwork and you think it's also the case in Japan when we think that in Japan there is a uh, first the collectivity and the organization came first and the individual uh, came after uh, is it also the case in 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 Japan? Toyota is different from other organizations. They have a totally different history in Japan, um, um, where they have a different view on work and how much time you spend there. But um, the, the main theme when I was there was that the employee is the king or queen. So they try to work with that, and that's what they are working with, work-life balance and work efficiency, and that's where I got the ideas from. Okay, merci beaucoup. Thanks a lot.